I have a voice. The turn. Brooke woke up three minutes before the 6 a.m. alarm sounded, went to the kitchen to squeeze oranges, brew coffee, and cook two scrambled eggs with spinach leaves. These they serve with a half of a tomato with olive oil, salt, pepper, oregano, and a toast of, with jam. They ate while listening to Sabrina Claudio's About Time, pretty <laughs> voice soothing. Brooke got dressed in blue jean overalls with a couple of colorful patches on the knees. They fastened the loose overalls with a full leather belt. Underneath, Brooke wore a long sleeved t-shirt with a print of a stone wash saber to the cut from Los Angeles Tar Pit Museum. Brooke applied a subtle blue eyeliner and patted Vaseline on their lips. I need to look like I am me today. Brooke braided their long hair and tied it in a bun. They grabbed their messenger bag, identical to Eric's. They smiled tenderly. Brooke tied an NYU purple hooded fleece jacket around their waist and walked swiftly towards Utica subway, telling the beat of a song by Magaluna, couldn't say it better, singing out loud. And I came again, rock and miss a new day. Heard it fall and rain, you said you heard the same thing. Drink so close, we taste it. Things feel like they couldn't really be. Brooke had an early class at the university, another in the early afternoon, and in between they were to meet with their honor thesis mentor, leaving just a lot of time for a break before they will begin Monday's evening sh shift at Oceano. Chef Michael had added more nights, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Sundays, except Wednesday, March 22nd, which was their graduation ceremony. Today will be their first new shift. The NYU campus looked at the academic activities were dwindling. Freshman students were going home for the summer and some spring courses had already finished. Brooke's last class required to complete her minor in cultural anthropology was Anthro III on archeology span and studies of early societies and cultures. The professor was showing a presentation review in the first weeks of the spring semester on one of the topics that Brooke had enjoyed the most, the paintings on the walls of Chauvet Cave. The professor spoke from behind the lecture in a stirring voice. These paintings were created by an artist 35,000 years ago. She explained how archeologists and rock and expert, art experts had studied the remains of skeletons of bears near the pictograph on the wall, pictographs on the walls and had concluded these creations were part of a vision quest undertaken by ancient shamans. On the screen, the panel of the horses stood out as so the horses were galloping across the alley between the two rows of seats where about 2,000 students interspersed, leaving vacant spaces in between, as if afraid to sit too close to one another. Brooke shook their head. In their four years at NYU, they had only become close to four people. The first had been Nick, their freshman doormate, a super tall and built football player from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the sweetest guy Brooke had ever met. Brooke thought that they'd been matched to share the same room on campus due to similar tastes in music, at the top Kendrick Lamar and Tupac, their love of obscure quotes from common movies, and fear of flying. They couldn't find more affinities to explain the computer selection. Perhaps their heights, though Nick doubled Brooke's physique. They became best buddies very soon, and although Brooke wasn't so much into sports, they will attend Nick's practices and games regularly and support him in all athletic events. Walking about campus with Nick empowered Brooke and made them feel safe. Trust me, mate, I know how it feels being constantly aballed at, he said to them. Then it was Shakira, a Latinx dance major who Brooke had met at one of the required sophomore courses in linguistics, and they both hit it off speaking and singing in Spanish together. She will ask, she will ask Brooke to critique her Yoruba dance routines while Brooke will learn new moves and sing along her choices of Cuban tunes. Brooke's favorite was a YouTube video with the Orishas represent, which featured Heather Heatley, that they could sing by heart and that they could, would sing it to their mom over the phone. Brooke was drawn to the notions of the Orishas, those deities worshipped by people with African, indigenous, and Spaniard heritage alike. Shakira will also share stories about her grandmother who was a curandera, who had healed lots of people. 
Brooke was intrigued by these stories, which Shaq would tell them as they rode the city and the New York boroughs aimlessly. Sígueme a su quitar. They take trains to shady restaurants to try eating foods from everywhere. Shakira and Brooke will take all risks, take tasting everything, knowing that some meals will ensue stomach aches, barns of hot spicy food, or trigger sugar binges. Later on, Brooke met Sophie on their second semester at NYU. She was a Milwaukee transplant recipient of multiple grants and scholarships whose major was cultural anthropology, and she was the dopest geek Brooke had ever met. She doubled as intern at Prometheus Books, learning to edit creative nonfiction, philosophical, and scientific galleys. And Brooke liked that she's known about Blair and Blair Publishing before they mentioned their book, Eric, to her. Brooke would listen to Sophie rambling about philosophy until they fall asleep, which will irritate Sophie. So she would throw things at Brooke and until they wake up, will wake up giggling apologetically. Too much info for my feeble brain, Sophie. Pity me, amiga. But Brooke felt the soft, that Sophie was a soulmate for a previous life. They, be, they felt multiple deja vu about things they say to them. And Sophie was the only one who, of Brooke's friends who understood math as easily as they. Hey, amiga, we wait the same. And Sophie would laugh, you geeky math whiz. There was Jasper too, from the who knows where in America and Japan studying political science. Brooke had met Jasper performing as Ocean Jade while bartending at the Lips Tracks Queen Show Palace in Brooklyn. Brooke recognized Jasper immediately from the NYU's cafeteria. He would always sit in the corners against the yellow wall. He was very clumsy, bumping into things and people as he walked as his, as his tray, with his tray, with his tray still in a swagger. Once he walked towards a table next to Brooke's, he, his huge headphones sitting on his head like a topless hat, his long and straight black hair falling over his back. Jasper stripped over a backpack, stumbling in sequence until his hand slammed on Brooke's table with a loud slap. He said, my bad, and by one, while winking complicitly. Taking advantage that the classroom was dark, save for the projector's light on the screen, Brooke spent the entire class session drawing on their no notebook. They had written their midterm paper on rock, art, linking it to shamanism and rituals. They didn't care much for a review of material that they knew in depth, but the truth is that Brooke couldn't concentrate knowing that their birth mother had also loved caves, caves and cave paintings. Next week, exam will be easy peasy, lemon squeezy either way. Brooke sketched while repeating to themselves in their mind their mother's words from her journal, surprise of their memorization. <laughs> Maybe I am redoing my family's tombs and curses, as Sister Agnes said. But I know I wasn't expected, I wasn't planned. My existence was not to be predicted or prevented. And as far as I know, I wasn't wanted at all. But this baby is. I vow to love my baby. Do not be dismayed, Bubble. bubble. You are the consequence of surprise, and you are that which causes the awe of wonder. You are a force of nature, a tsunami that rolls out stretching like a big wave, roaring across the oceans, but that arrives at the shore in a gentle unraveling of foam and surf, drawing a milky way form of salt water beads and pieces, titillating on the sand. I have no idea how I'm going to stand this, but I'll try my best. True evanescence, evanescent, evanescence. I had thought that uncertainty and despair were the gradients of my life before I'd known about this flower growing inside me. I had walked a broken bridge, hanging from a thread over a dry and rocky lands and abyss. Now, at the beginning of week 18 of carrying this baby within me, I vow to carry it with love. I will not fear what it may become of me. I no longer doubt what lies within my nature because it is in my nature where life is. Brooke translated Cassandra's words onto an image entitled an ekphrasis of Cassandra's vow of love. On the page, 
There lay the Milky Way glistening on the beach and a sunflower emerging from under the sunlight with soft pencil lines with a great knee effect and graphite smudged by Brooks' fingertips. The negative space rendering a translucent veil or an almost transparent cloud, water as a glass panel over the sun, revealing from beneath multiple sparks. Cassandra's entries cl closed with Natalie Merchant's lyrics from Wonder, so Brooks sang it in their mind, humming imperceptibly. Thank you.